Hey folks, uh, you got Benjamin Diggles here, VP of Business Development for Constellation Labs. Um, wanted to do a quick video. Uh, hopefully I don't uh, be too exhaustive here on this, but uh, we had some questions around the uh, enterprise and I thought that this would be a, a good way to just kind of go through those and share some of my, uh, I guess, perspective, if you will, on each of these questions. Uh, maybe it will lead to more questions, which I'm more than happy to answer since uh, I love answering these things. Um, Again, I've been with Constellation uh, for about a year and a half. Um, been running the VP of business development role focused on enterprise engagements, consortias, ambassadors, and so forth. Um, and had easily uh, well over 100 calls, interfaced with a lot of enterprise engagements. And so uh, not only from our own experience, but others, some of our colleagues in the industry, um, we have a, a pretty solid insight. I know that we've largely been rather quiet, and maybe some of these questions might help answer why that is. Um, so without further ado, let's let's dive in. I've got this list here, so if you see me looking down, I'm just uh, referencing my list of questions. Uh, so the first question is, why does Constellation focus on the enterprise? A really, really great question. Um, you know, when you think about, while our technology is rather lightweight and it integrates within existing systems, uh, it also solves very big problems around uh, big data, large problems in the big data space. Um, you know, when you think about the limitations of a linear blockchain solution and consensus models like proof of work or proof of stake, um, they don't really have the capacity to handle those big data standards. And, and really, that's where the directed acyclic graph, I think, plays a, a big role here. And so with the, the architecture that we've put out, it really meant uh, that we had to kind of uh, look at the industries that merited those types of needs and throughputs. I mean, we didn't go after financial because that's not really what we wanted to focus on, but rather we looked uh, largely at, you know, things such as AI, machine learning and autonomous networks, uh, really in the mobility space is where we fell early on, because the thing that those all sort of have in common is that they require a lot of data. They, you know, um, if you think about um, and, and uh, artificial intelligence or, or machine learning algorithms, uh, you're really not going to get, like, I guess, sustainable or, or kind of that uh, network effect of, of results out of those algorithms unless you have a ton of data. And the issue with that is that, um, you know, a lot of that data is, is crap, you know. Uh, and so being able to validate that data early on before it makes its way into those systems is really a, a key solution need. Um, and so... While, yes, there may be startups and, and some in the mid-market that are focused on some of these big data initiatives, um, those that are in the enterprise space have legacy systems that have so much data uh, that they're dealing with that's either stuff that's been sitting there or stuff that's being created uh, in the moment. Uh, I think I read a stat recently, uh, pretty, pretty profound actually, that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. So that, that shows you that, wow, data coming online at that scale is, is a big deal. So when we have our solution that is not a linear uh, uh, a chain solution, but rather more of like a block graph, if you will, as more data comes on, the faster it becomes. It becomes very appealing to the enterprise. So um, it's not necessarily that we're going after enterprise because they have the deepest you know, checkbooks, um, but rather that they have the biggest issues that our, our architecture can solve. Uh, the second question here is what are the partners you have been talking to. Uh, one thing that I think is very fascinating is that we, to date, have never signed an NDA. Um, so we actually are allowed to talk about whoever we want, um, you know, and that's very weird to me, but I also think it kind of matches the esoteric nature of this industry we're in. Um, you know, I used to work at Oracle prior to coming on to Constellation. And as you can imagine, I almost couldn't even share my name sometimes without having a, a mutual NDA or some NDA on our paperwork in place. Um, you know, it, it's not that it wasn't that bad, but, you know, it definitely was a lot of red tape. But with regards to company, um, you know, I'll, I'll actually I have a list here of names that we've talked to. Um, this is a, just a, a kind of a sample. And, you know, it's a pretty big sample to kind of show you, um, you know, the breadth and the width, if you will, of all the different types of companies we talk, we've talked to, because whether whatever industry they're in, if they're in banking, if they're in IOT, uh, or mobility, um, you know, maybe they're in telco. It doesn't really matter because they all sort of have the same issue around big data validation uh, at scale. So, um, so the the name of some of the companies we've been working with are Boeing, OSR Enterprises, Aris, Goldman Sachs, IBM, Bosch, Continental, BMW, Risk Block Alliance, Honda, Diamante, 
Transdev, U.S. Air Force, uh, Royal Bank of Canada, GM, Locomotion, Car Auction Services, Veritagris, Voyant, Daimler, NASA, Intertrust, Embraer, Stackpath, SAP, Factual, National Institute of Science and Technology, uh, or NIST, uh, NetSoul, Access, uh, Asset, Access Sec, I always say that one wrong, Caruso, Uber, Stripe, WiseKey, Lynx, SSH, Advance, Uptake, they just keep going. I mean, we have a, a really, I mean, these are all outfits that we've interfaced with. Some have had multiple conversations and uh, a good handful of them that we've gone into exploring um, RFPs and POCs. So those are some of the names that we've been talking with. Um, the next question is, what are the lessons learned from the conversations? Um, I think this is probably the most uh, personal and, and deep piece of this that shows what we've actually taken away from having these conversations. Um, and, you know, there's a vast difference between the people that you know in their space uh, that, that what people know in this space, uh, meaning, you know, do I, does the person I'm on the phone with actually really understand what's happening in distributed ledger technology versus those on the phone um, that really deeply understand it and want to make actually like take action on it. And it's just vastly uh, across the board, if you will. There's a whole gamut of different personality types that we've talked to in that uh, that list of names and more. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, I feel like most of these companies are trying to learn as much as they can. So I think that's why they have a readiness to take a lot of, of, of calls and get on the phone and explore stuff with us. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really tricky to figure out who the persona is in this that we should be talking to that is that's new to blockchain. You know, there's there's no chief blockchain officer. And, you know, I don't know if there ever will be, um, but there is a chief data officer. Is that the right person or is it maybe a data management team? Is it maybe a director of data science? Um, you know, maybe it's the CTO. We've talked to a lot of CTOs. Um, we've talked to a lot of VPs of engineering. And there is no, like, I guess, silver bullet on those personas of who the decision maker is. Um, I have learned a lot, though, that those that are in charge of innovation or think tanks or emerging, they tend to be time wasters, you know, not to be a, a jerk about it, but um, you know, they're really paid to fail. They're paid to explore this stuff, take those learnings and go back to their executive team or their shareholders and, and, and give that information of what, you know, the finger on the pulse, if you will, what's happening in the market. Um, so, yeah, I call those like kind of the paid, paid to fail types. Um, you know, I've also learned that companies uh, have really sort of settled in with dealing with bad data, like almost like it's kind of just now the world we live in. They have so much that they don't really know where to start. Um, and, you know, they're doing what they can with a lot of existing technology as out there, a lot of manual labor. I mean, Uber is one of my um, favorite examples. I mean, think about Uber and some of their, um, you know, quarterly losses that they're posting. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars because of due to their high operation costs. That's, that's because sifting and sorting this data and managing an, an ecosystem and, and uh, a system of that magnitude is really hard. In the amount of time I've even been talking about Uber, I can't imagine how much data they've been creating. Um, you know, a good example is like they currently have so much data coming on that for them to like forensically figure out what happened in the case of a dispute, say somebody has an issue with their ride or something like that, um, it costs them more money to deploy systems and manual labor to figure out exactly kind of what happened um, than it is to just reimburse the money. I mean, that's just like hemorrhaging cash. And it shows that they're gr kind of growing faster than their systems are capable of handling. Um, and many of them seem to have, you know, a theoretical or industry knowledge when it comes to this space. You know, oh, yeah, some people may claim that they're the blockchain whiz or whatever. That's usually a red flag um, because, you know, it's an early stage. And unless they really have formed a practice internally in their company, uh, I, I doubt that they're an expert unless they're moonlighting some pretty exciting projects, which may be the case. So I don't want to throw them all out. But very few have practical knowledge on how to deploy or use these systems in practice. Again, it's very early. However, I think that there's a lot of that kind of fear of missing out or, you know, the pressure that they're getting from their shareholders, their executives, their customers saying, hey, we, we want to know if there's a there there. We expect you to be exploring distributed ledger technology because we feel that the promise of this can really actually solve a lot of the uh, hurdles that we've been up against to date. Um, uh, what does enterprise want is the next question. Um, 
I feel like enterprise wants what any business wants, higher ROI on their technology systems with less failure points and lower risk. I mean, that that's pretty standard. Um, I think that uh, they see a lot of these groups see distributed ledger technology as a way to kind of leapfrog innovation that they've been working on and, and those hurdles um, in innovation that would give them a strong competitive advantage in market. So that's a very popular one. Um, those that are looking at ways to cut back on manual labor when it comes to dealing with massive amounts of data, um, you know, data scientist teams, as we've said, uh, are spending upwards of 60 to 70 percent of their time cleaning data before it goes into, a, you know, uh, an artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm system. Um, and then those, again, are just trying to really, I guess, cover their ass when it comes to uh, regulations. I mean, regulations are, you know, 90 percent of the world's data the last two years. Regulations are growing super fast. And, and those regulations are in place for a good reason, because a lot of these enterprise companies are more focused on revenue, go to market, satiating their customers features and functions needs versus doing the right thing foundationally. It's kind of like, you know, the biggest hack that we're going to potentially see that's never happened before is in the IoT space. And when that happens, it's going to be pretty, pretty scary. I guess my point is, is that sometimes these enterprise companies are going to market so fast that uh, they're, they're not really um, doing the right thing on behalf of locking that data down, mostly because they don't know where to start. Um, so, I think that uh, that's another big uh, thing that I think they, uh, enterprise is really wanting out of this solution. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel like the big thing that enterprise wants, kind of what I, I dub the holy grail, is that you know with the promise of DLT or distributed ledger technology, every company is looking to unlock a data exchange, some sort of a data marketplace where they can take and monetize or unlock new uh, either capabilities within their, their systems or new uh, channels of revenue and, and new partnerships. Hey, we can actually intermix our data with others and create a new marketplace. I mean, you think about BMW, um, you know, they, they announced when we were in Munich at uh, a Mobi conference this year that they're shifting away from being a parts and manufacturing company and they're going to be a services company, meaning let's make these machines that largely sit dormant for 97% of the time, these cars, and turn them into services, doing micro transactions, autonomous exchanges, machine to machine, so that they become way more of a, uh, uh, a services and Cha uh, new channels of data exchange company than just parts that sit there and have uh, are just essentially our depreciating asset. Um, so the next question is, how long does a sales cycle into enterprise take? I mean, in short, no one knows. I mean, because we really aren't into the world of of selling um, distributed ledger technology. It's, it's just not there yet. Everything's still around research and development. That's not to say that my role and what Constellation has been focused on isn't selling a vision. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when it comes to pricing and packaging a decentralized you know, framework, it, it's not something that you're really ready to just go out of the box with. You know, it takes time to educate, understand how it's going to integrate and work within their system, how you're going to go to market from a production uh, kind of transition strategy, and then how do you scale that to interoperate in a way that actually um, makes sense, you know, and, and that takes time to really figure out. And the way to go about that is you really find a wedge, you know, a use case that's something very simple, something I've talked about in the past, kind of like tamper-proof keyless entry being one wedge of, of an OEM car to, to put on the distributed ledger, and then you add more systems on and kind of scale that up to that, that true interoperating vision. Um, so, I mean, you think about how a lot of these groups are largely still in POCs and pilots. The money right now is really in consulting. That's, that's where we're seeing, you know, groups like, hey, let us come in and we'll be able to put some services dollars around us building a practice or helping you understand this from kind of like an outside consultant perspective. And that's because it's so early that a lot of these companies haven't built practices internally around their own, uh, around blockchain. So they need to have somebody kind of come in and help either jumpstart that or, or be that trusted partner. And you think about like consensus, you know, Ethereum subsidiary um, that really focuses on enterprise engagements. I mean, they generated somewhere, I think it was like 21 or $27 million in, in 2018. Or, um, 
with uh, enterprise consulting, a, a very, very um, no, notable number. I mean, I, that's, that's a lot of dough, you know, you think about an early industry. However, they had a thousand employees that were working on that. And I've met some of these folks and they're the smartest folks in the industry. I mean, these are really, really buttoned up people. So 21 million, if anybody knows <laughs> kind of some bis basic business rules, 21 million with a thousand employees is, is not a healthy company. And that's probably why they had to cut, you know, uh, half of those heads pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quickly to kind of make things balance out. Uh, but the point is, is that even when you're talking 20 to $30 million, that's really just kind of table scraps when it comes to the, the enterprise industry. You know, some of these companies that that would be nothing to them to, to absorb. So it shows how early we are in, uh, in this stage right now. But that said, uh, if I had to give a number from Constellation's perspective, you know, about a, a true sales cycle we're seeing, I'd say about nine to 12 months, which is you know not uncommon for an early stage infrastructure type of, of company handling large issues like this. So I think that's uh, fairly healthy, but again, it's still largely on the consulting and services side. So where do you see, the next question is, where do you see the enterprise and blockchain space going together? And this is the, the last question. Um, so I personally see, and this is you know my opinion, is that I, I think that blockchain is gonna become a commodity. Um, and that's kind of what Constellation wants, not to be commoditized, but that we become a trusted layer in, in a customer's existing ecosystem or their stack that brings the value of distributed ledger technology to their fingertips that can be invoked by an API call and where they can tap into a public network and, and get mass validation at scale. Um, you know, I don't think that a lot of these companies are wanting to like completely shatter their database structures and their systems and build from the ground up. They don't really have that option. That would pretty much wipe out half or more of the Fortune 500 companies if they tried to do that. Um, and so therefore, I think that this kind of API, blockchain APIs approach, um, being a lightweight, trusted partner focused on ex um, integrating an existing systems is going to be um, a, a very big piece. Um, I don't think that there's going to be one protocol to rule them all. In fact, I think that's kind of a, a dumb concept. I don't even know why people even entertain that. However, I do think that there's going to be pressing um, a pressing force against standards and regulations so that these various protocols interact from a kind of a standardized rules of engagement perspective. Um, that's where you see the consortia work groups, a lot of these companies coming together. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see, you know, some of these large companies like, uh, you know, a Salesforce and a Microsoft get together in a consortium in order to work on something together when typically they, they would not do something like that. Um, it's because they see the possibility of true interoperability around standards and rules of engagement so that these various protocols can, can really sing and, and do what they do best. So that, uh, that's my overview on uh, these questions I've got. If you, if you want to send more, feel free. Uh, I'm more than happy to do another one of these at any point. Uh, I love answering questions. And again, Benjamin Diggles, and you can email me, Benjamin at constellationlabs.io. Thank you very much.